yes, thank you to, to uh, Ted Coe's Tammy, Cassie, and Hal for making this happen tonight. Everyone should know about Ted Coe, but just in case, why don't I just give you a little bit of background? Uh, I'm very proud to have joined a little over a month ago, and Ted Coe's the Maryland Technology Development Corporation which was started in 1998. It's an uh, independent instrumentality of the state of Maryland, but it was really created to help uh, be a leading source of funding for startups in the state. But we also provide business assistance and we also help tech transfer and commercialization from our state labs and universities. So Tedco's really stated, it's created an ecosystem here in this state. We have several funds um, that I can outline. And um, really, you know, we have a, a, a fund for um, uh, stem cells, for cybersecurity, for life sciences. Um, and we also have my portfolio, which is the venture portfolio, which is Series A and up. Uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, I grew up in Maryland and I went to University of Maryland undergrad. I left and went to New York City to get my MBA, and I worked in New York City and Geneva, Switzerland for the past 19 years in the investments world. So I worked for eight single family offices, four billionaires, working on due diligence and in managing their portfolios. And a little bit later in life, I became an angel investor myself, and I really care about investing in women and diverse founders. And I'm just excited to be back in the state of Maryland working for Ted Cohen and with these powerhouse women. Uh, that I have on the panel tonight. So i just like to uh, welcome to Anuja Sonnefler, Dr. Sue Carr, Dr. Liz Claiborne. I'm just going to ask each of them to briefly introduce themselves, their company, and what their company does, and then we're going to go right into it. So since uh, Liz was here first, uh, why don't you go first and tell us uh, the name of your company and what it does. Hey everybody, my name is Liz Claiborne. Um, I'm an emergency physician and the CEO and founder of Nasoclip. So as an ER doctor, I was shocked at the number of people who would show up to the ER for nosebleeds, which I thought was a relatively simple problem that we had to use a lot of time and resources to care for in the emergency department. So, you know, as a mom, a doctor, and just someone who a lot of people call for help, I knew that we had to have a better solution. And that's what Nasoclip provides. It's simple and convenient nosebleed rescue that can be used by anyone in any setting. And we are going to be launching into the market this year. So I'm very excited to be here and can't wait to answer lots of questions. Great. Thanks, Liz. Sue, why don't you go next? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Sue. Well, you know, my name is Sue Carr. Um, I'm a pharmacist by trade, and I saw a problem a long time ago um, while attending pharmacy school involving filtering of ampule-based medication. For those of you who don't know what an ampule is, this is an ampule. Um, the problem is to get to the ampule, you have to break the neck, um, and it's a time-consuming, cumbersome problem. So I came up with the simple solution and founded CarTech. Uh, now we're a corporation, and we are preparing for FDA, and we should be on the market sometime in the next six months. Oh, very exciting. Anuja, why don't you go next? Hi, I'm Anuja Sunalkar, and I'm the founder and CEO of Steer Tech. And we build autonomous vehicles. And these are purpose-built vehicles for low-speed applications in private areas. So think of uh, you know parking and valeting your vehicles, or for fleets and uh, commercial customers, you know moving vehicles in a depot in a yard and op optimizing operations. Um, this is my third startup. I'm a technologist by training. I have a PhD in electrical engineering. And I had this aha moment uh, where, you know, I realized my passion was not just building technology, it was taking technology to market and solving a market need. And, you know, Steer is now in its fifth year. Uh, it took a long time to build the technology, but we started in the passenger vehicles and now we have uh, diversified into the consumer, I mean, into the commercial fleet business as well. We're rolling out uh, several pilots this year. You'll see us at uh, some very famous airports in the country this year and also some very, very famous marquee customers who you all make online purchases from. So uh, so we are, we are going to go mainstream uh, this year. Wonderful. That's really exciting. So let me skip around and go to Sue. Could you tell us a little bit more about your journey as an entrepreneur? Obviously, you discovered this while in school, uh, but 
you know, did you want to be an entrepreneur? And really tell us a little bit more about this journey, about how you got to where you are today. Oh, you're on mute. I know, I know. That's okay. It's the most uh, yeah. oversight statement in 2022. <laughs> <laughs> While attending pharmacy school, I worked at a local hospital as a pharmacy technician. And I noticed I, I had to compound a lot of medications packaged in glass samples, which I showed you. And the problem is to get to the medication, you have to snap the neck. And 100% of the time, glass shards will get into that ampule. So you don't want those glass shards getting into the patients. And you want to make sure that it's filtered using a proper filtering device, which is usually a filter needle. And then that needle needs to be recapped, removed, discarded, and a new sterile hypodermic needle needs to place placed on, on the needle. It, it's a complicated process and it leads to um, non-compliance um, in emergency situations and uh, all, all kinds of things. You don't want glass shards running around in your veins. So after that, I went into retail and I managed CVSs for about 17 years, but my passion was always hospital. So I went back to hospital and I continued to see the problem and it kept eating at me, you know, every day. And one day I was in the emergency room and I was filtering a, a medication for a life-saving patient and I couldn't find a filter needle. And I knew then and there that I had to pursue this and make a change. So I came up with, um, and it took a while, you know, going through patents and finding patent attorneys and my first patent they couldn't build a mold for. And then we had brainstormed with a company down in the research triangle area that I was introduced to. And we came up with a working prototype and then we came up with a, a patent finally after two or three years. So now I've got four patents. Um, and now we are, thanks to TEDCO, we are preparing for FDA approval. Um, it's been a long journey. I, I saw a problem and it still exists and I came up with a solution. Um, I guess that's kind of a shortened journey. And I, that I didn't even realize I was an entrepreneur until I guess I, I left my job and um, started to pitch at the Connect Entrepreneur uh, event, not the connect, well, a couple of pitches. I, I had to learn a lot. <laughs> well, it's a different skill set, right? I mean, exactly. Yeah. yeah I, I didn't know anything about business, um, yeah. but I feel I deserve an MBA now. <laughs> exactly. Well, Liz, why don't you go next and tell us about the journey? You know, as you said, you noticed people in the ER with nosebleeds, but, you know, did you start the idea right away or tell us about how you got to where you are today? Yeah, well, so similar to Sue, you know, I was just a clinician. So I was in my last year of residency at GW in emergency medicine, and I had, you know, my sights set on pursuing my academic career, and I am actually a faculty member at University of Maryland now. Um, but I just really, to be honest, was almost annoyed, but like more like bothered by the cumbersome nature of these epistaxis, which is the medical term for nosebleed patients. And I just knew that we had to have a better solution because we would do things like tape together tongue depressors to try to put it on the patient while they're waiting. Um, because when you present to the ER and you have something like a nosebleed, I'm sure it seems like a, an emergency for most people because you are bleeding, but you're not having a heart attack. You were not just shot. You know, you're not having a, a head bleed. So you might be waiting for several hours and that is very frustrating. And in that time frame, usually patients will exacerbate their problems. So they'll make the bleeding worse because they're stuffing stuff up their nose. They're pinching in the wrong area. They're not holding constant pressure. So I learned that there was a lot of like misinformation about how to appropriately treat nosebleeds. And if they just had the correct tools to treat the nosebleed appropriately on the first attempt, they wouldn't even need to see me. So that is really where the idea was born from. And so I, I started like Sue, just kind of dabbling in it. I, my first um, kind of delve into this area of entrepreneurism and business was um, going into the GW business plan competition. And we did really well there. And fortunately I had great guidance in the beginning. And I was I learned early on that I had to secure my IP, right? So I, I worked on my patents being secured. I also have multiple issued US patents. We just have another provisional patent that was just submitted literally this week. Um, and then I did, you know, the NSF 
i -Corps, which is a great program funded by the government that really focuses on customer discovery and ensures that you are like solving a problem that people are actually going to pay for your solution and that you're kind of going about it the right way before you pour your blood, sweat, and tears into something that may not have a viable business plan. So even though I have no business background, you know, I don't have an MBA, I didn't have training, I think that my understanding of like the problem as a clinician, as a mother, and as a family member that always gets called to help other people with their problems, I knew that this had, you know, some teeth to it. And so I started out little by little, and then I've gained momentum. And what's interesting to me is that now, um, especially after participating in the TEDCO Builder Fund and all the momentum I had in 2020 and 2021, I am like so proud of the progress I've made as a Black female founder because we're largely underrepresented in the space. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I, at the same time as building this company, I got married, I had two children, and I maintained my academic job as a doctor. And so there's a lot of challenges that I think that females face in this uh, arena that are unique that although challenging, actually, I think better equipped us to be, you know, dealing with the challenges of a startup and multitasking, interfacing with lots of people, understanding problems and communicating clearly. So the skill sets that I have as a doctor and someone who speaks pretty publicly about health policy and ethics concerns has translated really well into me being a CEO and founder. And I think that is what has attributed to me being so successful thus far in the space. But I do heavily rely on resources in that the state of Maryland has provided, ecosystems like what we have in Startup Grind, and especially my fellow female founders, where we can kind of have that camaraderie and encourage each other as we all climb forward. Yeah, you know, you made some great points. And, and I agree, being in the investments world for 20 years, uh, there are very few women, there are very few people of color. Uh, and, and that's something that is, you know, got to change. And, and by highlighting fantastic entrepreneurs like you, and also having the women who allocate the money, you know, uh, be in charge, that really helps. But I agree, you know, and women, I mean, we've been managing money since the beginning, or households, uh, since the beginning of time. So, you know, women can be very good at multitasking because they had to always uh, uh, juggle many things at once. So, it, and a lot of women don't have a safety net basically. So their business has to work. And so that's why, you know, for me personally, I find that, um, women entrepreneurs, uh, they, they do what they're going to say and they say what they're going to do. Uh, but let's go to Anuja and tell us about your journey. Now you said this is your third startup. So was, uh, autonomous vehicle something that you started in early or is that just something that came to you later in your career? Tell us about your journey. Uh, so my journey has not been your typical, you know, college entrepreneur type of journey. I took my time. I took the traditional route, just like Liz and Sue. I had an actual job doing something else. I got my PhD and then I went to work in the industry and um, I worked for some of the best companies, the best names building technology. And then there was this moment where our chief scientist from McAfee came calling all the people that he had worked with that left an impact on him. And he said, I'm building the next uh, frontier and in cybersecurity. And I'd like you to be part of that team. And so I jumped, I took the opportunity and I started working on cybersecurity, but in the automotive space. And it was a very, very new field. Um, the two words automotive and cybersecurity didn't even go together. And so we did some of our best work. Uh, that work was spun out um, by Battelle and uh, then it was acquired and then and so forth started my entrepreneurial journey. But I had an aha moment there at Battelle where I realized that my uh, my passion lay not just in building technology and solving hard problems, but also taking it to market successfully and seeing others use it. And so that go-to-market piece of it was the business piece of it was extremely attractive, extremely fulfilling, and and thrilling also along the way when you're doing it on somebody else's money. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know that that was a very successful uh, venture it got acquired by Honeywell and then I uh, started a second one with a, a few of my peers in the same space and so we had built up credibility it was easier uh, 
uh, easier to attract investment as well. And then we happened to be right place, right time. And there was a major cyber attack and we had the solution that would solve it. So one thing led to another and the company that had the most uh, financial impact because of that attack wanted to buy out our technology and that technology got acquired. So that was something we were not expecting at the time. But, you know, I, I learned as an entrepreneur that um, always expect the unexpected. <laughs> so at that time, I, I said, okay, we'll transition this technology. And I had just had uh, a baby and uh, he was about five months old and he was actually born with a, with a permanent disability. And I sat down and my husband said, you know, now is the time if you wanted to build something else, this is the time to do it. And I said, maybe this time I want to build something that has an impact on people um, like my son is. And so, you know, I knew at the time that I wanted to, uh, to build uh, something in the autonomous vehicle space, something that would create uh, new mobility options for future generations. And that's where, you know, I leveraged my background, it's still the same background, but that was the aha moment I had where I, this is what I wanted to build. And, you know, I looked for uh, the market niche and a gap. I didn't want to solve uh, something that would take 20 years to solve. I, I And I focused on low speed and I really created a business model out of that and studied the market. And I said, okay, this is what I want to go for. And that's where I started working on that. So the current startup was, you know, a combination of all my backgrounds and all the experiences I, I brought up to that point. Um, and it's been a, a roller coaster <laughs> ride. I think one thing that's interesting about all of you and while you'll be incredibly successful is because you're solving a pain point. People will pay when you solve a pain point. You know, another Me Too product or whatever isn't very interesting, but you have all seen uh, that there was something out there missing and having that ability to see that and then be able to act on it is what's because people have ideas all the time, but to do the research and do what you've done is is really significant. So, Sue, let's go back to you. And what is a pivotal moment in the growth of this company that really stands out to you? There are a couple of pivotal moments. I, I think the first pivotal moment was the last day of my work as a pharmacist, and the I had also uh, pitched. Up, it, it was the Tedco Prelude pitch. Um, I went in there with notes and not knowing how to run a, pro uh, a prompter or anything, and it was the absolutely worst pitch that I've ever done. <laughs> one of one of the the guys sitting there said, "I would never invest in that company," um, <laughs> but it made. I started attending workshops, and and on one of the workshops was a man that that teaches you how to speak. So I realized that I needed speaking lessons. So I hired him to teach me how to speak and to help me with my pitch deck. And then I had the opportunity to pitch in front of 500 or, or so people at the Cary School of Business for Connect Entrepreneur um, in front of Tammy Thomas, which I didn't even realize that she saw that. Uh, and that same afternoon, I had the chance to pitch at Fitzy, which is Frederick Innovation Technology Company, something like that. Um, it's a small uh, group of, of incubator accelerators, and I took the EDGE program through them. And um, But through those little nuances, they, I was able to secure a CFO, a CEO, um, a lead investor and an investment from Tedco. And, you know, at some point, people said, at some point, you have to jump off the cliff. And, and it was a scary jump um, because I, I supported my family until then. And well, I still support them, but, but I'm glad I did. Um, awesome. So that was it. Liz, tell us about a pivotal moment in the growth of your company that really stands out. Um, well, I have several. I'm going to tell you about two because they're uh, basically wedged on either side of the COVID pandemic. <laughs> oh, well, the pandemic that we're still very much in, um, as you guys are all aware. So, you know, I'm an ER doc. And so 2020 was, I think, a tough year for a lot of entrepreneurs. But for me in particular, um, it was a very challenging year that I think I actually turned 
to be extremely positive. So I was heavily pregnant when COVID hit. So I was a pregnant ER doctor on the front lines trying to build my company. And so that was a lot. And then I actually ended up doing a lot of media um, after doing interviews to, to talk about what it was like to be a frontline ER provider. And so um, that kind of uh, momentum of kind of coming into my own, finding my voice and really believing in myself to be this like powerhouse that I always knew that I was, was instrumental, I think, leading up to my maternity leave. And then what I did is I spent my maternity leave doing the Ted Co Builder Co fund program, which is what, um, you know, as I said, a lot of women have to do, right? Like we have to get creative with our time. And although I always encourage moms to spend that time with their babies, that was a really big pivotal point for me because um, Tedco not only provided capital that allowed me to get to the point of having an MVP, a minimum viable product of my um, device, it also gave me the advisory, um, you know, support and executive management training that I needed to take my company to the next level. So through Throughout the pandemic, instead of that being a lull, it was actually a huge momentum and kind of growth for the company. And I carried that into the following year and was able to successfully raise a pre-seed round of over $550,000. So we were oversubscribed and I closed that round in December. So I think going from a place where I wasn't even sure where the company was landing to having successfully closed a pre-seed round that was oversubscribed, again, as a Black female, where it's extremely hard for us to fundraise in early med tech startups, I was extremely extremely proud of myself. And I think that at the end of 2021, this past December, I now feel like, you know, the sky's the limit. And I'm really excited to impress not just everyone who's invested in me and believed in me so far, but all the people who have yet to hear about NASA Clip and, you know, kind of make this a blockbuster product. I think a big part of my mission, in addition to bringing this very useful solution to the millions of people that have nosebleeds every year, is also to, so that my story serves as an example of Black excellence, of the power and ability ability of women to perform well in this space. And so I hope I inspire other young women and people of color to pursue their dreams in the same way that I have. Oh, that's awesome. Very inspiring, Liz. Anusha, could you tell us, you know, what's the biggest challenge you've overcome as an entrepreneur? Uh, I think the biggest challenge I've overcome, I had to overcome as an entrepreneur is really, it was more internal. And I had to stop telling myself that I have to do everything. Um, you know, that's like entrepreneurial 101 is I have to do everything. And most entrepreneurs suffer from that, um, that, you know, failure is not an option. And they are completely passionate, driven um, for the success. And like you said also earlier is, you know, there is just no, no way, to, and especially for women, right? There's no way to fail. But I realized that, you know, I can't do everything. And I, I used to do that in my work. I used to do that in my life. So at home also in my family, I had to be super mom. I had to do everything for my children. I had to do everything at work. And I realized that I have to pick and choose what I'm best at and I can contribute the best at. And I have to be surrounded by other people who are just as smart and who can do some of the other things. So that's something that I had to actively work on internally telling myself, um, you know, that, that was, I think, uh, a big one for me you know it's funny whenever it's it, the expression if you want something done give it to a busy woman because she'll get it done you know <laughs> so actually let's go back to you Liz we'll change up the order a little bit and yeah let's talk about that um you know I think uh the bi biggest challenge you've overcome as an entrepreneur I mean I think with me too it's sometimes a little bit of um you know imposter syndrome like I've had that personally, like, you know, I walk in a room and, you know, there's no other women. Am I good enough? And, you know, I know that that's something that I, I had to overcome, but I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm. I, it's interesting because on my academic side, I do a lot of work in health equity, and, and there's a lot of literature that talks about that not only women, but especially people of color have this imposter syndrome. Anytime you're going into an environment and you're, you know, the odd woman out, um, it makes you 
question if you have the credentials or the capability or if you belong there. And what's important, I think, is that you first have to believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, it will be evident to other people that you don't believe in yourself and then they're not going to believe in you. And so you kind of have to, you know, quote unquote, pull yourself up by your bootstraps in the sense that you first have to be your number one fan. But when you do that, I think that that kind of energy and confidence is contagious and other people will quickly jump on. Um, I think for some people, because of some of the unconscious bias they have, sometimes you are going to have to show them more so than with other people why you are qualified to be there. But I don't think you should ever question whether or not you should be there. And if you get into those environments more often than not, you're going to discover that maybe you do know a little bit more than the, the people who you thought knew so much. Maybe you have a better educational background than the people you thought had like all these credentials that you were envious of. I think oftentimes I get into situations where, you know, I feel like, you know, I'm like not necessarily the most qualified person. And then after being in that environment for a while and interacting with people, I get more and more comfortable and become more aware that I actually do belong there more so than like, you know, just as much as anyone else. And so that imposter syndrome is something that can be dangerous because a lot of times it's a facade that you've like built up in your head that doesn't truly exist. And so you're going to have to be the one that breaks that down, but also, you know, look to others for, you know, learning their experiences. You're not going to be the only one that question yourself and even people who are, you know, majority, even white men, right. I'm sure question themselves and their abilities sometimes, but they're kind of brought up in this culture to just come off, like fake it till you make it. And it's not question where a lot of times for us, we're not given that same kind of support or leniency or, you know, um, kind of, you know, gifting in the beginning. So you do have to work a little harder at it. But I think in the long run, what that does is it builds your confidence and it just makes you more prepared and a better leader and a better founder. Yeah, those are great points, Liz. I think this is a great topic. If I may interject, you know, that there is a there is something to do with uh, a little bit of cultural background also you know sometimes it's not just the imposter syndrome like feeling that you have something lesser than others but it's um the the cultural indoctrination that goes with okay speak up only if you are spoken to don't initiate you know as your gender also like women who speak up you know are looked at differently than women who speak up when they're told to speak up so there's a little bit of that blended in um i when i walk into a room i don't necessarily feel that i am lesser than anybody else or i may not be the smartest group person in the room i know i am not the smartest person in the room but i do know that i bring a unique perspective i bring a perspective that nobody else may have there so i should speak up about it but again that has taken actively you know thinking through that and coaching myself to do that because i come from a culture where the women really are second to the men you know so that took a lot of um, active processing to uh, to disengage from my natural uh, way of uh, behaving and thinking wow that's a great perspective sue i'd love to hear about you know your biggest challenge um well, as Liz said, first, believing in myself, it, it, I think it just takes, you know, experience going to the I-Corp, like Liz said, and through Tedco Builder Fund. And um, I really had to, you know, find, find it in myself to believe in, in my voice. I didn't think I had a voice and, and all these years and then all of a sudden people are listening to me and listening to what I'm saying and, and I do have a voice so it's taken it, it's it's a growing process it doesn't come right away and I'm still working on it I'm still overcoming challenges um taking an idea and acting on it is also a challenge that that hit me early on you know how do I do this and I was uh I had kids and I was you know working full time and trying to come up with patents and and so this was you know my midnight job and and, and getting no sleep Liz knows what that's like um so then I had my, my challenges were were getting my first prototype and, and my first, uh, my second patent, because they couldn't build the first patent. And there are a lot of highs and lows. So you have to kind of find a balance. Um, for me, there have been a lot of lows, um, but uh, it's all good now. <laughs> That's great. I'd love to hear from all three of you about challenges in your particular industry. 
and how you, you know, view them and how you overcome them. So maybe uh, why don't we go back to you, Liz, first? Sure. So I think that the uh, space of uh, life sciences, especially uh, medical devices and uh, med tech can be challenging because unlike a lot of, um, you know, virtual tech uh, or, you know, just other investment opportunities, we have to find investors that are kind of in it for the long haul. There's a lot of opportunity in the landscape of startup investing where you can get a quicker, safer return for your money. And so it is important to seek out um, funds that are coming from investors that kind of understand what goes into making a life science challenging. And I do think that that environment is heavily impacted by the economy, by other things that are going on, right? We have all the issues with Ukraine and COVID and all these things impact, you know, where investment dollars go. And I think that um, areas like um, life sciences can get heavily hit hard in a negative way um, when those dollars are get drawn back and people are then kind of more likely to drift towards uh, safer investments and just, you know, um, technology that doesn't involve so such an arduous and long process for potential um, R&D, FDA approval, and just like the kind of longer term um, time span that it takes for you to potentially get to market and then have a return on your money. So I think given that, it's important that you are able to articulate a story that conveys why this is still an important investment and a lucrative investment. Um, I recently participated in another conference called WOCON, which is Women of Color Connecting. And a lot of what they talked about was that, you know, don't let investors tell you that, you know, that what you're doing is impact investing or they're investing in you because, you know, it's good for the investment environment or this medical thing, they're investing in you because you can make them money. Like it's actually a sound business plan and they have a bias that maybe says, you know, that this is more risky because you're a woman, because you're a, a person of color, because you're a technology life science company, when that's not necessarily always true. And so I think educating your investors and letting people know like actually why you have the credentials and statistics to back up why you're successful be from just a straight business perspective is important because people will assume that things are more risky when in, in, in reality, that's not always true and the numbers don't always bear that out. So you have to be aware of like what that story really is so that you can move forward with your fundraising and um, your success with your business um, because you're able to kind of bring people on board and get them on your side when you show them a, a clear path forward for, you know, making a turn on their money. Yeah, you know, I've done a lot of hardware investing in my career and yeah, I totally disagree. I mean, a lot of medical devices, I mean, they, they, they don't need to necessarily take 15 years, you know, and, and there have been early exits and things like that. So to me, I mean, I, I love hardware as well. So uh, yeah, I agree. But Anusha, with your industry, it'd be interesting, what are the biggest challenges? I think a lot of people talk about Tesla probably, right? And Elon Musk, but, and there's probably a lot of myths around autonomous vehicles. And, and so it would be great to hear from you about that. So one thing we have common, all three of us, is that, you know, our industries are very physical industries, not like the digital industries where everything is all digital, like Facebook and Google and everything is on software and you're in your computers. When you're building a physical product, a physical device with hardware and with you know, in my case with hardware and software, there are long um, development times. You have to get it exactly right. And you're in it for the long haul. Your um, volumes are very important, but there is a very large scale impact you can make. And in the automotive industry, when calling it hardware is an understatement. It's a car. Like that's the biggest piece of hardware that you can run software on. So it's really, really uh, complex. Uh, it is a regulated space. So you have to find your unregulated niche so that it doesn't become a roadblock for you. So these are all challenges we've seen. Um, Tesla doesn't help because when you do engineering on a fast track and you take shortcuts and you put product out there because you want to win the rat race and be the first, but you put something shabby out there, it does a disservice for everybody else out there. So really what the media message they carry about autonomous vehicles is only half the story, right? There's so much of uh, of doomsday stories and so much of the Tesla um, bad news that you see that it creates a shift in people's mind thinking, do we even want this? So you have to overcome that obstacle as to what the benefits and the pros are here of, you know, increased productivity, increased safety, and all the things you get with your time reducing your stress and 
it's just a convenience and it's automation and everything once you use automation it makes your life more convenient you're never going to go back to the stone age right um the other um the other obstacle the other challenge we've seen in our industry which is very particular here is monopoly and there is a monopoly with the car manufacturers where they control the supply lines they dominate the volumes market and the pricing and they also dominate the go-to market right so if you're building product that goes on vehicle you have to go through one of the big automaker companies like it has to be going through their brand finally and they will white, want to white label your technology and, and it's there are things like that so you have to overcome that monopoly and there are few examples out there even we've done that uh, successfully is to bypass those automakers to directly go to the customer and then that creates a new dynamic because now they these these organizations that are so used to monopoly realize that oh she's eating my lunch and so i now need to work with her because she has the voice of the customer and the customer is saying that they like this product and so those are some of the things that we had to really think outside of the box how do you go directly to the end customer whether it's b2b or b2c um very typical of our industry but those are some of the challenges uh that you know we've seen there are more but i these are the, my top two i would say yeah. that makes sense so sue you know it would be great to hear any advice you have to give an entrepreneur starting out and maybe i'm going to combine two questions which is any advice to someone starting out but also you know yeah what you wish you had known earlier in your journey i i wish i had started earlier that's for sure um, I, and, and I never really realized I was an entrepreneur until I, I left and, and, um, I guess I accepted into the builder fund. Um, really the best advice I, you have to be passionate about what you're doing and it resonates. It, people can tell, you know, if, if you're telling the truth, if you're passionate, um, they can feel your vibe. So you have to be passionate. You have to know your why. You do have to network and you do have to figure out um, research, like, like join the, I, take an i -Corp program and find out if, if it's something that people want. You have to validate your value proposition is, is the reason why you're doing it. So it's really important to talk to thought leaders in the industry and, and, to be passionate mostly about your why and not to give up. If you really believe in something, don't give up. There's going to be highs. There's going to be lows. You have to find a balance and you have to balance your home life with your per work life. Um, yeah, you know, you have to work with your heart and soul 24 hours a day because it's always on your mind, at least for me it is. But you have to find a balance doing exercise, eating right, meditation, and, and just kind of keeping on a schedule on a day-to-day -day basis kind of makes it easier. Um, but it's about the why. That's great advice. So why don't I just hop back to you, Anuja? Same thing. Any advice you give starting out and what you wish you had known earlier? I would say focus is the advice I would give entrepreneurs just starting out. Um, to be able to, you know, zero in on what you want to build, the why behind it, um, what does it look like, um, and then to get very early your product market fit uh, and, you know, the strategy um, that you want to go to market with. You have to have a relentless, very sharp focus on where you want to go with this. It is very, very easy to get distracted with, the, oh, there's an opportunity here. Oh, it's, this is slightly different, but let's do that or this. If you start doing that, you start diluting the message, you start diluting the product and you don't get to MVP and you can't demonstrate um, what you started to demonstrate. So really, uh, I would say early on, that's what you want to do is to focus once and um, Say the, the other side of that coin, and this is what I would advise uh, uh, other entrepreneurs as well is, and I should have also, you know, I wish I knew I'd done this before is build faster, but, and focus on what you're building. But once you've built it, um, 
the same thing may be applicable to, you know, there may be a slightly different use case and a slightly different customer, but they have the exact same need. And so you should be able to translate the story to their need and their pain point, and you can use the same product. What we found in, um, we always had a strategy where we would start with the consumers and automated, you know, parking pain point, but, um, and then move to the commercial. But what we found during the pandemic was that people stopped driving. People stopped moving around. Everybody sat in their homes and sat on Zoom calls and nobody was going anywhere. <laughs> So, so that put an end to that story very quickly It's like, okay, we've developed this product, but and we were focused on building it. So we built it right. But we realized that this exact same problem is the other side of the coin for the commercial markets and the commercial business. Drivers can't show up to work because they're sick. Uh, people cannot get out of their houses because the governors of the states have locked everything down. But goods still need to move and travel. People are ordering more and more online. And these... Um, Delivery companies are bursting through the seams. They can't deliver product fast enough. So you can now use the same automation in their yards and their depots to streamline their vehicles when their workforce is not showing up to get these vehicles ready. And when the driver comes in, you maximize their time to go and deliver product out the door. So again, same same problem, same solution, same technology, same pain point, just a very different looking customer profile. And so I wish I had done that earlier is to focus on very on the various different customer profiles that the same product. So keep focus on what you're building, but expand the profile of those you can serve with it. Yeah, be able to pivot when you need to. Right. Liz, we'd, I'd love to hear from you, you know, any advice. Yeah, I mean, I think that Anusha just hit the nail on the head and you were able to articulate the word I was going to use, which is ability to pivot and mentorship. So I strongly believe in any kind of profession that you're pursuing, you should identify a kind of near career mentor, someone who's a couple years ahead of where you want to be, someone who's mid-career, and then someone who has done this, you know, for 20 plus years. And I identify those people and keep updating them as you progress in your journey. That will give you a number of things. First of all, it gives you obviously different perspective, but also will help you with some of those self-doubts, those questions, and also just connect you to other people that can be useful along your journey. Like some of my best connections were colleagues of friends of friends. Like, you know, you never know who you're going to bump into and you need to constantly be networking and putting yourself out there and being accessible. Uh, and sometimes that means like pursuing someone. So you, it's not always going to fall into your lap. You have to seek out that mentorship. You have to ask the questions, but then th uh, people are usually help, like willing to help you if you show any interest in initiating um, a relationship or mentorship with someone who you're interested in talking to. And then the second thing is, you know, being able to pivot. Like there are so many things that are you're not going to be able to prepare for. And so you, I think for um, a lot of entrepreneurs, like, you know, you're so married to your idea and you love it and you're, it's your baby. And it's hard to like conceptualize changing that or having big shifts, but that's what's necessary to be successful in business. And so COVID like really basically illuminated that uh, point to a lot of people who had to shift uh, and pivot their businesses in response to the pandemic. And for me, I think it kind of illustrated with NASA clip the need for like, you know, an at home, you know, nosebleed treatment service. Cause you know, before the pandemic, I thought it was unnecessary necessarily to be in the ER for nosebleeds, but during COVID, you certainly don't need to be there for your nosebleed uh, when you have this additional risk of potentially picking up something that could seriously harm your, your health. And so um, it was actually easier for me to deliver that message of like why it's important for anyone to have nosebleed rescue accessible anywhere without a medical provider. And so I was able to capitalize on that message and kind of illustrate why this can be the band-aid of nosebleeds that exists in medicine cabinets and, you know, glove boxes and purses across the world. Um, but I also had to kind of do some pivoting because we wanted to try to get to the market faster. And so, you know, in medical devices, we've already talked about the timeline and some of the ways that I've looked to pivot and circumvent that is that we're going to the market this year with an un medicated device. And in my mind, I always wanted the device to launch onto the market medicated. So we have, um, in case you guys are wondering, because people always ask me, this is what my device looks like. Ah. So it's a nasal compression cl um, clip. It provides external nasal compression. And then there's sponges that go in the nose. And this comes, this idea came to me because we usually will tell people to spray Afrin or oxymetazoline up your nose, which is a vasoconstrictor. And it's the combination of the medicine with pressure that will knock out nosebleeds fast. And so people will usually just ask to spray 
spray Afrin up your nose, but it's hard to spray a liquid medicine up your nose when it's bleeding. So I always wanted these sponges to be, you know, pre-medicated with the clip. But what I learned is that we can go to the market with this unmedicated on a 510k exempt class one device, meaning I can go to market right now. And then we can actually co-pack with the device, which is kind of a way to, or with the medication, which is a way to almost circumvent the FDA until we get the approval and studies needed to have the device fully medicated. And so I had to do that pivot. So I'll show you guys how it works because everyone always asks me and I, I like to show folks because it's easy. So, you know, if you have a nosebleed, in case you're wondering, you want to clear your nose of any clots, bend forward, and then you would just basically put these sponges in your nose like this, uh, rotate the clip into place and you pinch it shut. So it provides constant uninterrupted compression. You leave it in place 10 to 20 minutes and then you simply release the clip pull it out and check for bleeding. And it can be rinsed and reinserted two to three times, but only intended for one time nosebleed um, use. So that's the device, right? It's simple. It's like Band-Aid of nosebleeds. Uh, and But I had a lot of ideas about what exactly I wanted to look like, what materials I wanted it to be made out of, how I wanted it to be delivered to the market. And this is not exactly what I had initially pictured in my mind, but it's better in so many ways. And the reason it's better is because I was flexible and able to pivot. So that's what I would tell young entrepreneurs, seek out mentorship and be ready to pivot. Well, Liz, you're on a roll. So I'm going to keep with you and, and ask you, you know, what keeps you motivated? Uh, certainly. I mean, I think I alluded this to this before, but like, I definitely have a passion to uh, really just knock this out of the park to serve as an example to other women and to other people of color and to mothers, right? You know, I have two small kids. I mentioned that I had a pandemic baby. So I have a 21 month old at home and a three-year-old. So, you know, I'm definitely in the throes of like being a mom of small kids, juggling that with still practicing clinically, which I think is important for me to understand the landscape of treatment and having credentials as a clinician uh, and building this company. And so it's a lot like, you know, as Sue mentioned, you know, I'm not sleeping as much, but it is so, so important that you do have that balance because, you know, burnout is real and you're the only person that's going to be able to take it across the finish line. And in order for you to do that, you have to be, you know, solid physically, mentally, emotionally in the long haul. And so while I feel like, um, I'm excited and like, I don't know how long I can like keep burning the candles at all ends the way that I am. What motivates me is like how much momentum I'm gaining, how much more recognition I'm getting, you know, passing those milestones, like successfully having a seed round. I just got the NSF SBIR phase one grant, which is, you know, 256,000 of non-dilutive funding, which is amazing because I wrote myself a salary. So I'm finally going to get paid, which I haven't been able to do. So, you know, every little, you know, inch that I get along the journey just makes me more excited to take another step. And it shows me really that the sky's the limit. So I really have just built on that momentum and then understand that behind me, I have so many people who are proud of where um, I've been and where I'm going and just really want to see me be as successful as possible. So I want to make them proud in addition to making myself proud. Awesome. Awesome. Anusha, tell us what keeps you motivated? I think the vision of what we are building and how it's going to change the world, what an impact it has um, that is my big picture motivation, really. That keeps me going. And then when I see the journey of what we've built, what we've gone through, and every milestone that we turn, um, that just increases the energy and keeps me motivated. And, you know, when there are these down moments and, you know, it's my family, it's my tribe. So it's my family, my colleagues, it's um, people I've looked up to and learned from. It's also my teammates, you know, some, there's most of them are actually younger than me, but I watch them and I learn something from each one of them every day and they keep me motivated. And I do this because, you know, they believe in me and they believe in the product and they're moving um, at the same speed I'm moving. And it's, it's a gift really to be part of a, a team where others share your vision, your enthusiasm, your energy. And so we bounce off of, they keep me motivated. That's awesome. Sue, tell me, what, what keeps you motivated? Well, number one is, is my why. Um, it's why I do what I do. And, and, and I know it sounds corny, but, but I've always said, if I can save one life, then my journey's been worth it. It's been a great journey. Um, and, and I'm not done yet, right? Uh, and, and also, I, it's the village that I've built through the Biohealth Capital Region and all the support I have, especially with like people like Liz and, and my Builder Fund cohorts. We're still very close. Um, Tedco, Fitzy, 
the BioHealth Capital Region. Uh, just, just a, a, a number of, of, of different organizations that believe in me and believe in my product and knowing that I can save a life is, is golden. Knowing that, that I can save a million lives and, and be able to provide needles for countries that need it the most is, is another vision that, that keeps me motivated. So I'm not going to stop until I get there. That's awesome. That's very motivating. Well, one thing I'm not going to ask you, because it always bugs me, is say, well, you know, women always get asked, well, how do you balance things? And they never ask men, male CEOs that question, right? So, I mean, it, th that's one thing that I, I find always kind of frustrating. But what I do want to know, and we've got a great question for the audience, and also the rest of the audience, bring them, you know, right to us. But I did want to ask, you know, are there any books or podcasts or speakers that inspire you uh, that you could share with us? And then, um, and then we have, uh, I'll take the question from the audience, but maybe Sue, since we were just with you, if you could. Uh, sure. Well, for startups, I would recommend Ash Mayura. Um, what is it? Scaling Lean and Running Lean. Those are like number one books to read that help you with your interviews and, and, and everything. And they're really short and simple. Um, I like Simon Sinek. I think he's, he's awesome. So you need to go to YouTube and, and watch about his why and, and uh, some of his vi YouTube videos, Steve Jobs, of course. Uh, and I, I, I really like Jay Shetty for meditation. And he has a podcast called On Purpose, and also Rich Bendis has a podcast um, with BioTalk, and he has a lot of good things. And I listen to Ted Coe's speakers. Um, I, I read, uh, most recently, I read uh, Jay Shetty, Think Like a Monk, and, and I really like the book Bad Blood. I know it's, it's talking about Elizabeth Holmes, but it's everything you shouldn't do, right? <laughs> Um, and, but she was able to raise a lot of, a lot of money. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah, that's true. Great. And Liz, tell us. Um, yeah, so I have some specific uh, things I'm going to share in the chat. So, um, Cheryl, um, Conti, who's one of the, um, leaders of uh, the impact seat, which is one of the organizations that invested in my pre-seed round that has a fund specifically focused on female founders, wrote a book called Mechanical Bull, How You Can Achieve Startup Success. I would highly recommend that people tune into that. She is a black female founder that had an IPO exit. So um, really great to learn from her experience. She's like one of my mentors. Again, that's why I'm like so big on finding that mentorship. Um, so so, you know, you can, if you read something you like, reach out to that actual person. So, you know, she's like now in my, you know, bullpen, re cheering me on, helping me to fundraise. And um, that's one thing that I would uh, recommend. The other one that I'll also paste in the chat is a book called Sabbath by Wayne Mueller. And so I talk a lot of times to my residents about the importance of wellness and why wellness is needed for buffering burnout, which is very real in medicine, but certainly real um, in this arena of business and startup because you are really grinding all the time. And that question that we get asked by women really should be applied to everyone. And I'm appreciative that you mentioned that, right? Because I think the expectation and the language needs to be changed so that men are expected to be balancing the home life as much as women are. But everyone really in our society now needs to be focused on what they're doing to have wellness. And part of that is making sure that you're resting. And I think resting means uh, a lot of things to a lot of people, but it's more than just saying like, well, I'm going to have a day to run errands or clean my house. It's really like, what are you doing to nurture yourself? emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually. And so I read this book when I was like really stressed out. And what I took away from it is that I have to actually schedule in my calendar times where I have rest. So I actually practice a Sabbath of Monday. I chose Monday as my Sabbath day. Um, sometimes it's only half a Monday, but it's still a Monday. And that's usually because the worst day of the ER is Mondays. So I don't know if my coworkers have caught on that I never get scheduled 
clinically on Mondays, but it's like the busiest time in the ER because everyone waits on the weekend when they do all types of things they're not supposed to do and then come on on Monday to get help. And so Monday is my day of rest. And it's a, it's a time where I try to not schedule meetings. I don't require myself to answer emails. I don't have to pick up my phone. I basically give myself the space to do what I want, hang out with my kids, watch a reality TV, you know, whatever it is that helps me reset. And I think that having that practice is important because we live in a society where we really have this disease of busyness uh, and it will eat away at you over time. And if you do not build in those safeguards uh, to pre prevent yourself from burning out and, and protect your wellness, um, then that will happen and you won't be able to perform to the best of your abilities. Uh, so I would encourage everyone to check out those books. Um, and, you know, I hope we get to learn. I, I mean, I think it'd be great to have like a reservoir of, of uh, specific, uh, I think, you know, resources when it comes to kind of wellness in the startup world. I think that would be very helpful because everyone has little tidbits that I've learned from that have been super helpful, but this is my particular practice that I always tell everybody about. I think that is great advice. You know, when I started my career in New York and Wall Street, people bragged about getting up at three in the morning and having four hours of sleep. And that's just stupid. And now I look at it, I'm like, thank goodness you need sleep and people need that, you know, because it, your brain cannot possibly function at a hundred percent without that. So that, that is fantastic. So I think Anuja, I wanted to ask you about any podcasts or books. And then I think we have one or two questions from the audience. And then I think we're going to open it up. Sure, Liz, those are fantastic resources and, uh, you know, great storytelling there. I, um, so I have one resource for people who are thinking about becoming entrepreneurs and, you know, you're at the edge, you're on the fence and should I do this? Is it for me or not? And um, there was a book I read, it was called The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. And he's a phenomenal uh, motivational um, writer. And it was right place, right time for me because I was having what he calls the upper limit problem. It's like, okay, this is it. I don't think I can do more than this. I've hit my max. No, you've not hit your max. And your next big leap is after you cross that upper limit, right? So he really walks you through uh, some good examples and uh, it really reflects back on you. And uh, I thought it was just a wonderful book. Lean In to me was transformational. This was when I was still a tech techie and I was, you know, I was doing all the things she said in there that this is why we're not taken seriously is because half the problem is us, you know? And I really realized, oh, that's me. And then I read the next, oh, that's me and that's me. And so I realized that, okay, if half the problem is me, I need to fix that half, right? Then I, you know, I can't sit and have a pity party about, oh, I'm a woman and this is how I'm treated and this is so hard for women. No, it's not. It's like half the problem is here. So that was a transformational um, book that I read. And my hands down, my most favorite person podcast essays or just listening to her speak YouTube anywhere is Indra Nui. Um, she is the ex-CEO and chairman of PepsiCo. And, uh, you know, so many things about her that are so relatable to me personally. Um, she's a woman. Uh, she is a mom of two kids and has a family. She is an inspiring leader, comes from the same ethnic background as me. And so she faced the same cultural challenges and the same cultural biases that I had to overcome. And so every podcast, every essay of hers that I hear or I read, it makes me feel like I've just grown uh, from it, you know, right from the things she talks about, like, um, you know, marry the right husband and how important that is in your career and defining uh, who you are and what you want to become and follow your vision, your dreams and the support system that that creates starts from the husband. And so then the family and everybody follows suit and um, how to balance your family, family's needs and your uh, work needs. And especially if you're a CEO and you're the boss of things. And when you come back home, it's like now you have to share space with others and you don't necessarily have to be the boss of everything, right? So how do you balance those? It, it's very, very insightful. And it's things that she has said that um, you can practice and live every day, you know? So it's very inspiring. Uh, yeah, she's a fantastic leader. Well, I want to get to a few uh, questions from the audience. So uh, one of the questions from our participants, uh, Jeannie Lynn said, can you talk about how you found your founding team? Any tips for solopreneurs to round out their support, like advisors, founding members? So it'd be great to hear from you about that. So uh, maybe Sue, do you want to start first? Sure. Well, it started... Um, 
I know of a personalized health accelerator. It was called IPHA. They had a program and, and I think um, I had my second patent had just been approved and I, and I realized I needed help. So I applied for it, but to apply for it, I needed a video. So I filmed a video. Um, I got into there and they accepted three people, six companies into the summer program. And, and we had to pitch every week in front of investors and leader, thought leaders. And one of the thought leaders said, you need a CFO. So she introduced me to who's now my CFO. He's awesome. His name's John Brzezinski. Um, and he kind of Help me navigate, you know, who to talk to and the thought leaders and the big needle companies. I call them the DNCs, just my little acronym um, so I don't slip and mention the names. Uh, <laughs> and uh, because of him, I'm where I'm where I am today. And then as I was growing, I was trying to fill out the, the to apply for a tax credit. It's called the QMBC Biohealth Tax Credit that Maryland offers. And I realized I needed to be a corporation. And to do that, I needed, I needed more assistance. So I called my good friend, Kathy Callahan, the director of FITSE and said, Kathy, I need a CEO. So she uh, made arrangements for me to get a CEO. And I knew it had to be a man because it's a man's world, right? We all know that. Um, but he's really good. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm glad. Um, and it kind of balances everything out. So because of him, I'm, I'm where I am today. We are now went from an LLC to a corporation. A year later, I did qualify for the Maryland tax credit. And I was able to save six of my investors 30% of their investment they get back. Um, and we're still, you know, in the final <laughs> stages of it. But it's, it's, it's coming along, and uh, I guess that's it. Um, that, that was very helpful. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, you know, then I brought on a research and developer, and I had a secretary and, and I, who believed in me from the start. My secretary and my vice president are both pharmacists, and they saw the problem, too, and they believed in my solution, so they came on earlier. And I had first bootstrapped, and what bootstrapping is, because I didn't know what it meant, was you you use your own money. And I was able to do that because pharmacists get paid, you know, a fairly decent salary. Um, so I bootstrapped my way through two patents and a prototype. And then after bringing on a CEO, a CFO, and a researcher developer and qualifying, and, and then I, I had to take investments from friends and family. Then Tedco came in. Um, then before COVID at that last pitch competition, I met Old Line Capital Partners and stayed late and showed them a demonstration of the frog filter, which I can show you if you like. Um, and uh, we, uh, it took them a year. They're like, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. But once I brought on a CEO and, and became, and we're still doing the corporation, that's what kind of was a pivotal moment. So it's bringing on the right people and having advisors and mentors taking a, an accelerator or incubator class like the EDGE program, that they have mentors there and building a relationship with them. Um, so basically what you do with the filter now um, is the current filter is the tip is relocated at the end. So you insert this into the ampule. Once it's done, you remove the filter and then you inject all in one step, all in one package. That's fantastic. Anusha, why don't you tell us too about your founding team and any tips? Uh, so this time around, I was a solo founder when I started Steer. My last one, we had four of us and all four of us, you know, after that exit, all went and we did solo things. I went to build self-driving cars. The second one went to create coffee tech. So he was going to build the next biggest, best grinder in for coffee. And one went to, and is the founder of Bugzilla. They are looking at silkworms and creating a uh, hmm. technology to make silkworms produce more silk. Uh, the fourth one is building AI for bridges. So we all went to follow our passion and do very different things. Um, 
I took a very different approach this time. I started as a solo founder. I had an angel investor join me. It was one of my investors from my previous company and some of my investors from my previous companies followed. It gets easier to get investment when you're in your subsequent runs and you've done it successfully for them and they see the track record. Um, but this time I decided to build a team that was much younger and coming from uh, a newer perspective. I wanted um, the newer perspective. I didn't want people from the industry because the people in the industry I noticed had hit a ceiling. They were all stuck in the same rigor of problems. And I wanted to just, you know, have people in the fresh uh, start. I also this time around wanted to give back. And so I wanted to nurture and groom new talent and, um, you know, develop a, a, a stronger workforce and just grow uh, the team more organically that way but it's very challenging it's very hard you have to be prepared to um, do a lot of the heavy lifting up front so some of the issues we had if I had a more experienced team it be, would have gone faster but this is way more fulfilling and more rewarding you know when things work out well you can say that um, otherwise you are full of regrets but uh, I just found that um, you know it's it's very very tough uh, first of all solo founder i would not recommend on anybody that on anybody unless you have nerves of steel and you're really prepared for that 4 hours of sleep and um waking up at very odd times and and balancing everything and you know right from the finances of the company all the way to you know all the engineering you're ha looking and handling everything on a daily basis unless you're ready to do something like that in the earliest stages it's not for everybody uh, but you want to grow talent and people around you and do what I said is like, you know, figure out what you want to do and you do best and is in your zone of genius and everything else you start grooming others to take over and you create a strong uh, team. You know, that's really successful companies are made by successful teams. It is not a solo sport. So even if you're an entrepreneur and it's your idea and it's your vision, it is still a team sport. And so that's what I would say is the biggest thing is to build the team around you. Liz, love to hear from you about your team building. Yeah, I mean, I think that was great adv advice about team building and how important it is. You are heavily judged when people are investing in you on the strength of your team. And oftentimes that is who they're investing in is the leader and the team. So um, for me, I had uh, two co-founders that were introduced to me in the GW ecosystem. So I thought I came up with the idea when I was a resident. And so my attending, Dr. Neil Sika, who was reading, leading the GW Innovation Center at the time, kind of mentored me, but he actually connected me to an undergraduate. So someone who is like a biomedical undergraduate who's just interested in startup. And he has now blossomed into like my COO, went on to business school and engineering school at Dartmouth, and now actually works in venture capital and is like leading our go-to-market strategy. And so it's so funny because like I met him when he was like a baby and now we've been on this journey together. Um, so you, I, I don't, I would encourage people to look, you know, in all different places for how you might build your team. I certainly think it's important for you to structure those big C-suite positions with people who are going to complement your skill set and fill in the holes where you don't have as much experience, but don't underestimate, um, you know, the ability of like, uh, you know, an intern that might be a go-getter and like really kind of build you up over time. So the other place that I have been able to kind of round out my advisory report has actually come through my participation and connections and um, the Ted Co-Builder Fund and like other actual accelerators, uh, both um, accelerator programs and startup competition. So the assigned mentor that I had in the Ted Co-Builder Fund actually came came onto my advisory board after that program and has continued to be a pivotal, pivotal, um, you know, a mentor and advisor to the company. And then he introduced me to a number of other people that have been very helpful. Like our entire marketing group that we're using came, you know, from Dave. And then there were some other connections I had from doing the Ignite uh, Women's Pitch Competition, um, where I, I was placed in the finals and I made a, an, an impressive, I impressed a judge during that competition, Dr. Juliet Breeze, who was a fellow emergency medicine physician, but she she owns a chain of urgent cares in Houston. So now we are piloting the device in a uh, pilot study at her um, urgent care chain. And she invested in my pre-seed round and she will be someone who will place our like first purchase order. Plus she kind of knows the whole ecosystem of urgent care in Texas. And so is really, you know, 
just from impressing that one person who I didn't even know really was going to be judging me during that competition, it's turned into this huge fruitful relationship. So always have your eyes open for like where you might be able to um, seek out an advisor, an investor, or a new member of your team, because it's not always going to be necessarily where you expect. And I, I would encourage people to look up and down, right? Like to where they might have uh, help coming their way. Yeah, that's a good point. You never know. An intern can turn out to be a fantastic employee. So, well, I think we're going to wrap it up. Just one last question for all of you. You know, what do you really hope for the future for female entrepreneurs? You know, what do you hope for yourself and for other females in your position? Why don't you go first, Liz, since you just finished? Uh, well, I'm sure you guys can guess what I'm going to say. You know, I I believe in the power of women. I think that, you know, men and women are different sometimes, I think, in the way that uh, we're wired, right? Like, I think from an evolutionary stand, standpoint, right, there's just a different loop that information, data, our perception, our relationships works. And in my opinion, um, there are many things that women do naturally that make them better leaders, founders, and business people. And so I think that I'd love to see us better harness that power and really forge ahead with changing the landscape expectations and stereotypes of how we can perform in the business world. Because I think that we are a formidable power that has been underutilized for you know, eons. And this is really like our horizon. I mean, it's only been in like the last 50 years where women really have been able to step out of the home and some of the other domestic responsibilities that have kind of in some ways weighed us down or prevented us from flourishing in ways that, um, you know, our, our, you know, predecessors, our ancestors were able to. And now I feel like we have an obligation, especially those of us who are motivated like myself to step into those shoes and encourage others, because it's not just going to benefit other women. It's going to benefit the entire world, right? The, you know, brilliance that we have, the resilience that we have, um, the imagination, the ability to multitask. And really actually I think it comes down to like our ability to like, look at problems and better empathize, conceptualize, and um, treat um, others the way that we want to be treated because we're always in that caretaker position, I think more mentally, that could make us very successful. So I'm very excited to see, you know, what the next 10, 20, 50 years brings. And I hope that um, I'm riding this way with my fellow female entrepreneurs um, and kind of showing everyone what we're made of and what we can achieve, you know, in the business and startup arena. Very inspiring, Liz. Very. Anusia, why don't you go next? And then I agree, see. I agree with everything Liz said. And, uh, you know, I would love to see more women entrepreneurs, more women in uh, in business rooms and boardrooms, actually. I, I've noticed that even on board yeah. seats, there are very yeah. few women um, there. I think we should consciously push for that until we can get, you know, some sort of uh, a stronger representation there. And it's all because of what Liz said. Uh, women have a very different perspective. We have more empathy. It's just our DNA. We are built like that. Like That's our natural um role uh, to be able to empathize, have compassion, multitasking, and also optimization. So all, um, you know, all of the studies that I've read and seen show that women are actually much better at optimization problems than men are. Meaning if you have, and in real life, you have that is you have multiple constraints. There is not a one-on-one -on -one matching for everything. You have to solve for what is the best thing to do given so many different things going on. And women are actually able to absorb more of those factors in, in their decision-making and pick up more dimensions, more factors and make these very uh, deep decisions. Whereas men are only able to pick one or two of the maybe the shiniest objects and they concentrate on that and they solve for that. So this is like, a, this is a proven you know uh, thing. You, you can see it in interviews, you can see it in analytics, you can see it everywhere. They pick one or two, whereas we try to solve for eight out of 10. Right. So you want a healthy board that is a representation of men and women so that you have both kinds of problems. So I won't say one is smarter than the other one is superior than the other, but you need both there so that you have these diverse perspectives. Same thing as an entrepreneur, you need both. 
because we will solve problems differently and we will provide different solutions to the world and there are so many problems out there same thing with, with the business world um I, if i had a penny every time somebody told me you need a man to help you negotiate that or i've had i've sat in a room where somebody said do you have anybody on your team who we can talk money with yes me so you know there it's it's hard it's hard to do business my own husband says that to me sometimes like i know it's very hard for you to do this i'm like uh okay so it starts from there so he means well but sometimes he says that so it, we have to overcome that as women also but we have to put more women out there and i think that will just change the dynamic a little bit and even start with women to women negotiations and and then the men to women it'll all just blend together right? i think seeing more of us in leadership positions in um in in business entrepreneurial board etc all these very critical strategic decisions uh, venture in venture also i would say you know there are not enough women in venture and uh, there are not enough funds for women in venture both go hand in hand i think um uh, there are there are some like uh, you know Catherine who are very successful uh, people in venture who are women but you know for every I think one female VC you have 10 male VCs so again it's there's not enough uh, out there. Sue why don't you wrap it up? Sure and and, and I agree with Anuja and, and what Liz said uh, definitely I think this is, you know, the age of women. I think we're finally stepping into new shoes and, and emerging. And I think the next 10, 20 years are, are going to be pivotal for um, women to um, be e equally represented in the business world as CFOs, COOs, CEOs, um, venture capitalists like yourself, Catherine, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, very impressed, you know, that you've gotten this far and gone to Wall Street and, and women like you just kind of inspire me, right? Um, so I think equality and um, merit and, and people, you know, based on your merit and, and your experience. And I think women are much better at multitasking than men, but that's just my opinion. Well, you know, I feel such hope I didn't always feel this way, but I can't even tell you, I started my own list of all of women who are investing in other women. And it's amazing how many new VC funds there are, angel groups. And so I, I feel tremendous hope because, you know, it's not just women starting the company, but the women allocating to other women and knowing that this is not, I don't do it because I think it's an impact investment. I'm doing it because you guys are going to be awesome. And you deserve the money to make your companies thrive. And so it's not an impact investment to me. It is just getting the money to the right people. And so I, I do find, I, th I think there's a lot of hope out there. There's a, a lot of, of research about um, women being fantastic leaders and CEOs. So, you know, I want to thank you. I know we kind of went over, but you guys were so interesting and you had such incredible comments to say and and i'm just so glad i got to meet all of you virtually and talk to you and listen to you and i think we've learned a lot from you and and so i appreciate your willingness to come on and and tell us uh so much about yourselves and your company and and so i think we we might have chris or someone else come back on from startup grind but i know i've been talking a lot but i just want to say thank you for this opportunity you know, they, they, I have something um, to add about the power of women and, and investing. Uh, there are two women um, who I know, they have a VC firm. It's called Hannah Gray VC. Oh, yeah. They were both, they were both partners at uh, major venture capital firms, and they left because even though they were partners, the male partners, sorry, guys, um, never would... Um, invest in what they wanted to invest in. They said that they were just a checkbox. They were just a box that, that was being checked, you know, to have a female, you know, VC on their team or whatever. So they formed their own firm. And today they announced that their very first investment, which is an ed tech company, uh, just raised 29 million in their series A. Yeah, I actually know Hannah Gray. And that's a great example of women who said, you know what, we're going to go raise our own VC funds and invest in what we want to invest in. So great, great example. 
So, and I mean, listen, we don't mean to be male bashing, but this no, is No, I'm not time. trying to. Hey. No, no, I know. Gavin. In general. <laughs> I'm reading the hey, go for it, guys. Go there. for it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, yeah I'm go Sean, for it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I am going to state flat out Catherine, Liz, Sue, Anusia, thank you for having helped us put on what I think is the best Startup Grind Maryland event that we have had in six years. Oh, <laughs> and and wow. I'm not and I'm not one to throw a you know a bunch of flattery out of people. You. There was more here tonight than I can even begin to summarize. So I am not even going to try. You guys have done a beautiful job. A couple of things that really stuck out at me, though, that I'd like to, I'd like to use as kind of wrap-ups. Number one is you all talked about some of the resources that you, um, you know, fall back on. One of the resources that I fall back on very, very strongly is a book by Eckhart Tolle called The Power of Now. And one of the things that I did to help myself become a better person and a better entrepreneur is to practice the concept of focus on the now. What happened yesterday is done. You can't change it. Don't worry about it. And you don't know what the future's, you don't want to know what tomorrow is going to bring. So your best option is to focus on now and the next 24 hours and don't worry about everything else. That is a big lesson that I've, you know, I've taught myself. The other thing that I heard, and I think this is a huge uh, testimony to the ecosystem that we are building here in Maryland. You've got resources like TEDCO. You've got resources like Liz, the Builder Fund, the Rubric Fund, everything that's involved with TEDCO. You've got the Maryland Innovation Center. You've got Fitzy. You've got an incredible ecosystem down in, in, you know, in the downtown Baltimore area. It's about reaching out, asking, do not be afraid to ask for help. You know, we are here. You would be amazed at what people will do if you just say, hey, I need some help. Can you give me some advice? And I think you, all of you on the panel really communicated that beautifully. And for that, all I can say is thank you for making what this being our 88th event, I think the most impactful event that we have held. The other thing I wanted to say is get involved in organizations. Get involved with Startup Grind Maryland. This is what we do. It's about connecting people and resources. Get involved with TEDCO. We have our Founders Forum coming up on April 1st, which is an informal group. It's a small, intimate, informal group of us founders and entrepreneurs getting together and talking just like we have tonight. Taking a load off, sharing your problems, sharing your concerns, asking for help. So if you're interested, please go out to our website, sign up for uh, our April 1st uh, Founders Forum. We would love to see you. That being said, does anybody else on the panel have anything to say? What we're going to do is you will be getting a post-event uh, newsletter coming out that will have links to this video that you'll be able to use and share and, and, and promote yourselves till the cows come home. And we're also gonna have a short survey we're gonna ask you to fill out to give us feedback, Sean and I and Patrick and Startup Grind Maryland to tell us what, what you liked and tell us where you felt we fell short so we know what we can do better the next time. So that being said, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for very much for participating. We've loved having you and we look forward to you being an intimate part of our community going forward. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.